Hello, Seekers of Truth. It's good to be with you again. Today is April 5th, 2018. And today I'm going to teach on what the Bible calls the Kodeshim. Who are the Kodeshim? Q-O-D-E-S-H-I-Y-M. You can find that word actually spelled out that way in the Bible that's called the Eth Sefer, which is C-E-P-H-E-R, uh, a Bible that I recommend that you get for a number of reasons. It has some very good uh, translations of the books of the Bible in it. So today we're going to discuss the Kodeshim. The Kodeshim are the holy people. Most Bibles translate the word as saints, S-A-I-N-T-S. I believe that that word saint has virtually lost its meaning in this world of apostasy that we live in today. You may have never heard the teaching you're going to hear from me today. If you have heard it, I would appreciate it if you would leave me a comment telling me um, who told you these things, even if that person was yourself through your own study. So we're going to start today with the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 33. This is called Moses' final blessing on Israel. Verse 1, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones. He came from the ten thousands of Kodeshim with flaming fire at his right hand. Yes, he loved his people. All his Kodeshim were in his hand. I want you to notice that this describes both fire and the Kodeshim in God's hand. So make that connection, fire and the holy ones, the Kodeshim. Verse 3 again, Yes, he loved his people. All his holy ones were in his hand. So they followed in your steps, receiving direction from you, when Moses commanded us a law as a possession for the assembly of Jacob. The law is very relevant to the Kodeshim. Then Jude chapter 1. There is only one chapter in Jude, but Jude discusses very evil people who are on the earth at the time of really the time we live in today. And then verse 14, he says, It was also about these evil people that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his Kodeshim, with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. To say the least about these evildoers, but notice that the Kodeshim, they come to execute judgment on all and also to convict, to convict the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness. So in Deuteronomy 33, we see that God comes with the Kodeshim in his right hand. Also, he comes with fire in his right hand. Jude prophesies saying that this is what Enoch spoke about and by the way this verse actually does appear in the book of Enoch and uh, the book of Enoch is is included in the Eth 
Sefer that I just told you about. Okay, now we're going to go to John chapter 17, and this is really where um, the teaching now is coming that I say you probably have not heard before. We're going to uh, begin at verse 1. This is the last lengthy teaching that Jesus gives to his disciples before he is captured and then led to his crucifixion. John 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Always pay attention to this word glorify in the scriptures. For over a year now, the Lord has had me teaching about the glorification of the, of the Kodeshim. I believe that glorification of the first fruits of the Kodeshim is at hand. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Jesus says here that he received authority over all flesh 2,000 years ago. And yet we have not seen that authority in action in the earth. Jesus, I think, is speaking now toward the future for a time 2,000 years later when his authority is going to go forth. Verse 3, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That is eternal life. We talk about salvation and getting saved. The, Jesus, the reason Jesus came is so that we could have eternal life. And he says that eternal life is knowing God. Knowing the true God. Knowing Jesus Christ himself. He noticed that he includes himself here when he says this. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. See, Jesus is pre-existent. He is pre-beginning of the earth. He is pre-creation because he is the one who created the earth and he created all things. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. One of the many scriptures where we get the concept of predestination. There were specific people that God the Father gave Jesus out of the world. Yours they were, Jesus says, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Okay? This is one of the marks now of these Kodeshim. They kept God's word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. Now here, we're now going to go to the new part. Many people will take all of the scripture as if it speaks to everyone or even speaks to all people who claim that they're Christians. But notice now in verse 9, he says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world. But for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Wait a minute. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that they should not perish 
didn't Jesus come for the world? What's this 2,000 years been about? Why did Jesus say to his 11 disciples here, Judas has already left, why did he say specifically, I am not praying for the world. I am praying for you. He's talking to the Father, I am praying for them. I am praying for these 11 disciples. Verse 10, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. We have to catch this. I am glorified in them. How is Christ glorified in anyone? What is glory? What is glorious? What does it mean to be glorified? Go back to a few scriptures before. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Can't, you, the glory of God is so awesome We cannot stand in his presence and live. We cannot, we cannot gaze upon the glory of God. And yet, Jesus says, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. That was Judas. That the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The mark of the Kodeshim is that the world hates them. The world hated Jesus, and the world killed Jesus. The Kodeshim are those who have been blacklisted, are those who have never been promoted to the high-paying jobs. They're the ones who don't have friends. They're the ones who are not asked to go to the parties. The Kodeshim are despised by the world. Why? Merely by their existence, the Kodeshim convict the world of their unrighteousness, of their lawlessness, of their dirty deeds, simply by being there. I remember when I was a state legislator 20 years ago and strip bars were just coming to this state. And of course, the Republicans... Uh, then as now pretended to be the righteous party. Not to say that the Democrats don't pretend all the time, but I'm just, sa I'm just saying this to say this. I was never invited with my Republican colleagues to visit the strip bars. Okay, they, they needed to know whether they should make those illegal or not, you see. So uh, I just remember... I was never invited. I'm glad I wasn't. I would have I would have politely said no thanks. But and that's not even to pretend that I was uh overly right as a legislator because one thing that God showed me as a legislator is that I am not perfect. I cannot bring 
the kingdom of God in my flesh. I'm not good enough. I will never be good enough in my flesh to bring the kingdom of God to this earth. And that is a heresy. The Reconstructionists were the latest ones that I know of. The Theonomists, that's another word for them. But those are people who believe in God's law. They, a lot of them had and have very lofty intentions, but they don't understand the sinfulness of the flesh. The flesh never gets in. We cannot get in to the kingdom of God in our flesh. We will never be good enough. Only by depending upon Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and his shed blood, his atonement for our sins, can we ever come in. Nevertheless, the Kodeshim do exist. Nevertheless, there are holy ones. And Jesus is speaking right now. He is praying for the holy ones. That's the point. He's not praying for the world. He's praying for the holy ones. Well, aren't, isn't the whole church the holy ones? Isn't everyone in a church called a saint? Yes, and it's blasphemy. Because the church has been rebellious. What we see as the church has been rebellious against God from the beginning. Practically from the very beginning. Practically from the time Jesus died. Or from the time the first apostles died. The church has moved progressively into corruption. How do we know this? Do we have a witness in the scripture? Of course we do. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. Now in Acts chapter 8, you have um, the apostles who begin to go out preaching. And in verse 9 it says, There was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed, Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, notice this in verse 13. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Simon believed the testimony of Philip. He believed the gospel. He believed to such an extent that he even submitted to baptism, and then he followed Philip. He became part of Philip's church. How many people come into the church they believe, they're baptized, they're in the church. And then what happens? Okay, so Peter and John go down and they pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Using the name of God to make money? Now, Simon is willing to pay money at this point, but does he perhaps have a thought that, wow, I could make a lot of money this way? Do you know anybody else who's made a lot of money? Who had an anointing? 
who could lay their hands on people and the Holy Spirit seemingly fall? But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. If possible. The man believed in Jesus. The man was baptized. The man was following an apostle. What do you mean, if possible, if his intent can be forgiven? And then he goes on. Peter goes on, he says, For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. How many people in the church are in the gall of bitterness? How many people in the church are in the bond of iniquity? These people are still in the world. These are not the ones that Jesus is praying for here. John chapter 17, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Can you say as a Christian that you are not of the world? I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. The Kodeshim are set apart in truth. The Kodeshim are set apart in the word of God's truth. The Kodeshim walk in the testimony and the law of God. They walk in the truth of God. Psalm 119 verse 160 says, The sum of your word is truth. God, the sum of your word is truth. The totality, one plus two plus three and on and on, the sum of your word is truth. The Kodeshim understand that and the Kodeshim walk in the sum of God's word. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world and for their sake I set myself apart that they also might be set apart in truth. And now we move on a little further. Verse 20. Now remember, Jesus is only speaking to 11 men, the first 11 apostles of the church. Then he goes on. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Well, that's how I have understood the word. It has been largely through the testimony of these first apostles that I have believed in Jesus, that I have believed in God. Let me read verse 20 again. I do not ask for these only. I'm not talking about just these 11, Father, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. See, we know about Jesus through the word of the apostles, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Ah. Suddenly we're back to the world. So what is the mystery here? He's not praying for the world. He's praying for these apostles. And then he's praying for those who will believe in him 
through the words of these apostles, but why? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. So the goal is that the Kodeshim will go forth in the power and the glory of Jesus Christ himself. And that through that power and glory, the world will know. We have not come to that time yet. That has never happened. You see, the entire history of the earth or of the last 2,000 years, and really the entire history, recorded history that we have, is God calling out a people called the Kodeshim, calling out a people called the Holy Ones. And then the Holy Ones are going to go forth as fire in the hand of God so that the world will know. This is the great revival that many prophets are talking about these days. It is not a revival like anything the world has ever seen before because it's not really a revival. This is going to be the time when the glory of God goes around the earth and throughout the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what this is talking about. And that's what Jesus was praying for, for those who would believe and also be part of the company of the Kodeshim that are so identified with him that they have become one with him. And then as we saw in the book of Deuteronomy, they are in his right hand. They're part of him. They're, what does the book say? What does the Bible say? We are his body. He is the head. We are his body. And we have the church, or people who say that they're the church, have mistakenly assumed that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and then lives, however, is part of that body and will be part of the glory. And that's totally incorrect because A holy one is defined by one thing. Holiness. Holiness. That's why so much is given here, like verse 17. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. God's word is holy. The Kodeshim are set apart in the holiness of God's word. I'm going to read from 20 now to the end of this chapter, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so we're one with him. The Kodeshim are one with him, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, so that the world may believe. There is great glory coming to the world. The world will believe the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. They will be glorified. They will be raptured. They will see Christ in his glory before the world sees them. To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them, 
that I may be in them. The Spirit of Christ is in all of the Kodeshim. Now, I'm going to take you to just a couple of scriptures given by apostles who wrote books. Paul, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, chapter 10. Very interesting. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I'm away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who, who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey God. Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. See, the obedience of the Kodeshim is not yet complete, and that's why the disobedient have not been punished yet. Notice in verse 5 also, Paul says that he is ready to take every thought captive to obey Christ. You know, he, he at this point, is not really talking about his own thoughts, even though that's the way we usually hear it in our churches. He is talking about taking the world's thoughts captive to obey Christ. See, the world has to realize that they have been thinking the thoughts of Satan, and we have to take those satanic thoughts captive and bring them into obedience to Christ. And this is coming. Then we'll go to Second Peter chapter 3 one of the initial apostles for uh, chapter 3 this is now the second letter that i'm writing to you beloved in both of them i am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions <clears throat> of the holy prophets and the commandment of the lord and savior through your apostles okay so he's talking about the old testament prophets and he's also speaking of himself and the other apostles Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where? Where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. <clears throat> They're stored up for fire. The fire that's in the right hand of God. See, we need to start accurately interpreting the scripture. What is the fire? Who can live with everlasting fire or everlasting burnings? Only the Kodeshim. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, <clears throat> that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. All should reach repentance. And that will happen. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Apocalyptic language. It, but if everything is simply dissolved and the works are exposed, then what? good does that do toward bringing people to repentance? So this is dealing with the coming of the fire of God that will burn and expose what has happened in the earth. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming 
of the day of God. I always wondered, what do you mean, hastening? How can we hasten the coming of the day of God? Well, as we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, our obedience needs to become complete. Because when the obedience of the Kodeshim is complete, then this is what will happen. So when the Kodeshim live lives of holiness and godliness, as they wait for the coming of the day of God, they also hasten it because their completion is the mark for the time when that begins, when the day of the Lord begins and when the glory of God will be manifested upon the earth through the Kodeshim who are in the right hand of God. So, those of you who seek the truth, this is what the Bible is all about. The Bible is about calling out of the world the Kodeshim. Those who are gods will hear his voice and they will respond. They will be the wise virgins. The first fruits of the Kodeshim will be the five wise virgins of Jesus' parable in Matthew 25. I believe, as I've said many times before, that we are now right on the threshold of the first fruits birthing of the sons of God, and that we had the sign of that birthing last September, September of 2017. And that the day of first fruits approaches, that the birthing of the sons of God is going to become a reality, and that it is when those sons of God's sons of God are birthed, that is when we are going to see what these prophets have been calling the greatest revival on earth. It has not happened yet. But it is coming. It will happen because the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And Lord, we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah. Amen.